turn in your Bibles to the seventh chapter, the book of Ezra, as we continue our study through the word. So you'll remember that the nation of Israel had been disobedient to the Lord. And you'll remember that the Lord sent prophet after prophet after prophet, and they ignored, ignored the voice of the prophet. And finally, you'll remember that God said that, that you are getting a timeout. And so he brought the Babylonians to come and to bring them into captivity. And so they lost their freedom. That is always a consequence of sin. Amen? There is always a loss of freedom in sin. Sin brings us into bondage and the sun sets us free. We are free in Christ. And so here we see that there was a physical manifestation of a spiritual reality. The enemy always tells you that sin is fulfillment, that sin is freedom. Throw off the shackles, the repression, the rules, the structure of your faith and, and there's freedom apart from the law of God. But the reality is the law of God is a hedge of protection around us that keeps us away from that which hurts and wounds and destroys and ultimately enslaves. And so we see that the nation was taken into captivity. And so the Lord told Daniel, though, when they were taken into captivity, that that God was going to bring them back again and that he was going to establish them back in the land once again. And uh, and so you'll remember that now was the time and there were these three returns back to the nation. The first return was led by Zerubbabel. And you'll remember that Zerubbabel gets the letter from Cyrus to go and to rebuild the temple and to offer sacrifices once again. And so they return. And now we're going to see that the second wave of return is going to be led by Ezra himself. The first six chapters that we saw, they were about Zerubbabel's return, which predated Ezra. So Ezra was writing about what he had not been a part of, but what had happened before him. And now as we jump into uh, the, this chapter here, chapter seven and forwards, we're going to see that this is going to follow Ezra as he returns with the second wave. And then there is a third wave that's going to come, and that's going to come in the next book, and that's Nehemiah. Uh, and so Nehemiah is going to come back. And so we're going to see that Ezra's desire is to make sure that the nation is worshiping God. They were back in the land, but they had been in the land prior to being taken into captivity. So just being physically back in the nation did not guarantee that their hearts had returned to the Lord. Far more important than their physical location was their spiritual development. And so he was a gifted scribe. He was a gifted teacher of the law. And so he is going to have this burden. He was a man of exemplary character. And his character was so noted by the king. You're going to see that he has great favor with the king, King Darius. And so we are going to see now this return that he is going to lead is once again going to be directed, uh, an edict is going to be given by the king of um, Persia. And so uh, here we see now as we begin Ezra in chapter 7, we are going to be following now this second wave that is going to come in behind Zerubbabel. And it says, now after these things, now we see that there was this interlude of 58 years between chapter 6 and chapter 7. You remember that the end of chapter 6 was that they got the altar built and that they had the sacrifices going again and that the nation offered its sacrifices and how exciting that was for the nation to be finally back into their land again, to have the altar built, to be able to offer the sacrifices. And, uh, and so that was glorious. People built their house and the sacrifices were being offered. But now there was this 
almost six decades, 60 year interlude between that first return and now the, uh, the second return that is going to be taking place. It is in that gap that we see the whole story of Esther takes place and Mordecai and how there is the attempt to have the edict to uh, wipe out all of the Jews and, and all of this. This takes place in between Zerubbabel and now Ezra coming with the second wave and so now after these things this is a long after these things it's not like a year or two it says in the reign of Artaxerxes uh, king of Persia Ezra the son of Sariah the son of Azariah the son of Hilkiah so we've got now the 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 description here of Ezra, he, his lineage, his genealogy is going to be uh, given to us here. But, uh, but we see that he is, Ezra is a descendant of Aaron through Eleazar. And he gains favor during the reign of Artaxerxes. And so we're going to see the king commissions him to return and to bring order among the people that have already returned that are already there in Jerusalem. And so we're going to see that Artaxerxes is going to give him a letter, a royal letter, and Ezra is going to carry that letter uh, back. And we see that he is going to uh, truly uh, be blessed. He's going to bring about some tremendous spiritual reforms when he gets to uh, Jerusalem. He gets back into the nation. So We've got Ezra, this amazing man uh, that God uses mightily here. And so verses uh, 2 through, I'm not sure, 6, we're going to see continued uh, of his genealogy. It says the son of Shalom, the son of Zadok, the son of Ahitub, the son of Amariah, the son of Azariah, the son of uh, Marioth, the son of Zerahiah, the son of Uzi, the son of Buki, the son of Abishua, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the chief priest. And so uh, here we see tracing it all the way back now to Aaron in the time of Moses. Verse 6, this Ezra came up from Babylon and he was a skilled scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord, his God, upon him. And so here we see that he was a skilled scribe, it says, in the law of Moses. And so he was a man of the word. He was a man that knew the word, studied the word of God, and allowed that word to penetrate into his heart, into his, <coughs> into his soul. We see that that he is going to, uh, to come back and lead the spiritual uh, reformation of the nation here. And, uh, and we see that it had been about a thousand years now since the law had first been given. And so there is going to be a tremendous revival that is going to transpire underneath uh, uh, Ezra. Now, tradition tells us that Ezra had the law memorized and could write it from memory. That's what tradition says. Can you imagine knowing the word of God like that and being able to just recall passages and passages you know i don't know about you but verses are impressive to me you know let alone you know passages and chapters that are just in his mind but god uses him mightily and he is a mighty man of the word and so he is skilled in the law of moses which the lord god of israel had given so god gave to the nation of israel the word of god and what an amazing thing the Word of God is. It is alive and powerful and sharper than two -edged, any two-edged sword. It is able to discern between bone and marrow. The Word of God, heaven and earth will pass away, but my Word will abide forever. And so the Word of God, the revelation of God's heart to mankind, 
What is more amazing than the Word of God? I can tell you that the more that I study the Word of God, the longer and the more years that I add to the studying of the Word of God, the more I love the Word of God. It is a light unto our path and a lamp unto our feet. It, it is spiritual sustenance and nourishment. It, it, it is everything. It is the most precious thing that we have here upon the face of the earth. There is nothing else that is eternal in this world except the Word of God. This is a piece of eternity that we hold in our hand. And so it is unlike anything else that, uh, that we have, that we possess. And so Ezra was a man that was deeply steeped into the, the Word of God. My encouragement to every single person is to know the Word of God better than you do now. Whatever, whatever degree you know it today, keep pressing forwards in accumulating the wisdom that is in the Word of God, the revelation of God's will for your life. This is his holy meeting place with man. Adam and Eve had the privilege of walking in the garden. And God said, I will meet you in the evening and walk in the garden with them. How crazy is that, that they could walk in the garden with God in the evening? Man, talk about looking forward to sundown, you know? I mean, it's like, oh my goodness, I get three more hours and then I get to walk with the Lord, uh, you know? And so that was their meeting place. The garden was the place where God met with them. But once they were gone, where's our meeting place? And it is in the word of God. He says, come and I will meet you in the word of God. When you want to meet with God, yes, you can find him in nature and you can find him in prayer and in worship, but it is in the word of God that he reveals himself to us. That's why it's alive. It is not just a history book about him. It's not God's biography, you know, by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but it is alive and powerful. It is the living word of God. Ezra was a man of the word of God. And so may we be men and women of the Word of God. It's one of the things that I love about Calvary Chapel. Calvary Chapel is known as we are the men and women of the Word of God. We take studying the Word of God seriously and chapter by chapter, verse by verse, even the ones with a lot of names. And <laughs> we're still, we are going through it. So if you think that we're not, you know, we are. We are because we're men and women of the Word of God. If we're going to be Christ's representative on the face of the earth, don't we need to know what Christ's position is in order to represent him and to represent him well? And so the word of God, the word of God, it is like a, an onion. It has so many layers to it. The more that you peel it back, the more you just keep finding the layers and the layers and the layers and the layers and the, layers and the depth. Oh, the depth the infinite depth of the word of God. I think that of all of God's creation, I think that we will marvel at the word of God, the way that, that in heaven, I believe that we're going to have eternity to be able to, to continue to be able to understand the word of God at, at, at deeper and deeper and, and deeper levels, that God designed it so incredible so incredible and i think that we will plumb just begin to plumb the depths of that but i think that but in heaven i believe that we will truly understand the word of god in maybe even possibly in its entirety because god says that when we are in heaven that we're going to know him the way that we are known by him and so if we're going to fully know him then then we will know the revelation of him now to a, a, a full extent. And so God is going to illuminate our minds in a way that we are going to be able to, uh, to understand. But the word of God, being men and women of the word of God. I want to encourage you to continue to, 
to do self-study, continue to be in the men's Bible study, the women's Bible study, to continue to be able to, to take it apart and to talk to one another with it and to discuss it back and forth. That's where the iron sharpens the, the iron. And, and this is something that you need to dive into yourself. God invites you into the depth of the ocean of his mercy and love and grace that's found in in the word of God. There is nothing that is more exciting than my wife will say, than having God speak to you. I mean, what is more exciting than having the, the, the creator God of the universe speak directly to you and, and have a word for you and for your life and, uh, and a touch upon your soul as he loves you and cares about you. And, and that happens as we open up God's word and when we set time aside to fellowship with him in the word of God and and we know the verses right I mean that that if we seek him we will find him when we draw near to him he will draw near to us and so we we have these promises of God to be able to do that and, and what is the great challenge in every single one of our lives is it not time you know, the, the, the time. We're so busy with everything that carving out that time. And yet, what is more important? What is more profitable? What is more beneficial to our lives, to our relationships, to our families, to our soul than the Word of God? So, next verse. We're flying now. Here. <laughs> If we keep up this pace, we're going to be here till midnight uh, <laughs> here. So, so he is this amazing scribe now. He's a, a man of the word. And the king granted him all his requests. It said in verse 6, according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. So God's hand uh, was upon him. And so if God be for us, who can stand against us? God's hand was upon him. But God's hand is upon each and every one of us uh, as well. God is for you. And his hand is upon you to lead you and to guide you. Verse 7, some of the children of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the Nethanim came up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. And so we see here that, uh, that now as, uh, as Ezra is going to lead the, the return. We are going to see that some of the children of Israel now, the priests and the Levites. Now, as the temple was finished now and built, Ezra is going to go back to a rebuilt and, and finished temple. We're going to see that now is going to come the, the wave of the Levites and the priests. And, uh, and so we see singers and porters and, uh, and all. There were a few that went up with Zerubbabel, but this, this now is the others that are going to come. And so in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes, this was the year after the temple was finished and so they had been back they had started the altar you remember they got the altar going uh, and all but they they started to rebuild the temple and then they just kind of stopped and then you remember that there was the big push and then they finally uh, finished the temple and so now we see that there is this wave of of priests and levites that are going to return it says and ezra came to jerusalem in the fifth month which was in the seventh year uh, of the king. On the first day of the first month, he began his journey from Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. And so it took four months to journey. It's a journey of a thousand miles from Babylon to Israel. And so this was, this was a large trip. It was a large caravan that went on this trip here. And they make it now four months later, four months of traveling. Can you imagine traveling for four months to get to your destination? That is a an arduous and long journey there. Uh, and so it starts in March and ends in July. And it says that according to the good hand of his God upon him, they made it. And we see Ezra is giving 
acknowledgement that it was God's hand that was upon them, his hand that sustained them, his hand that protected them and, uh, and directed them and, and supplied them with everything that was necessary for this journey on this four-month journey. And finally, they arrive safely at their journey's end. And what is Ezra doing? Ezra is giving credit to God. He's magnifying God and glorifying God for the victory of this journey of coming back. In verse 10 it says, for Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. And so here we see that Ezra had prepared his heart. And that's one of the things that I love about Ezra. The Bible tells us that knowledge puffs us up. And so here we see that Ezra wasn't a man that just filled his head with knowledge. We see that what he did was he prepared his heart. Your heart speaks about your relationship with God, about your devotion to God, your connection to God, your love of God. And so in order to love more deeply, more fully, you know somebody more intimately, more completely in the depth. And so Ezra's knowledge of God didn't puff Ezra up because now it was connected to his heart. And so your head and your heart need to be connected together. The word of God needs to penetrate not just your head, but the word of God needs to penetrate your heart also. There are people that I know who, and maybe you've met them before, that have a lot of knowledge, but it is stuck here and hasn't moved yet to here. And then there are those people that have that incredible love for God, but they don't have quite the knowledge of God yet. And so we need both. We, we need, and the Bible tells us, you know, that God is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. <laughs> and so we see here that, uh, that knowing God and falling more and more in love with God these are connected together. Ezra prepared his heart. Prepared his heart. How important that is. And then notice this. He, he prepares it how? By, by learning the word of God. He prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. He's like David. David was a man that chased after God's heart. He chased after the Lord. He pursued God. In the same way that, that a man will pursue a woman uh, and, and, and a woman will pursue a man as well when they are interested and, you know, they, they accidentally end up in the path of that person, you know, because they know that at 827 they go to Starbucks and so I'm just going to happen to be there at that time, you know, oh, <laughs> you know, but they're pursuing, they're not accidentally there at all. They're purposely intending on running into them accidentally. Uh, and so those purposeful coincidences and, uh, and all, they're actively pursuing. When you're actively pursuing, you're thinking about them. How can I get closer to them? Where are they? What are they doing? What are they thinking about? And, and how can I get connected to them? There is this pursuit of the heart. And and this is what David had. David had that with God. He would look at the stars and he would just, he would marvel at the, at the maker of the stars and he would write poems to God and he would write songs to God and they're called the Psalms and, uh, and he would just, you know, be, he's just in love with God, in love with God. He saw God's hand everywhere and and God ends up taking this shepherd boy and making him the shepherd over the nation of Israel. He pursued God's heart. Did he do it perfectly? No. He was a, a flawed man like every other man is flawed. We're all flawed. There's none righteous, no, not one. But, but what did he do? He chased God's heart. And so Ezra was a man chasing God's heart. And chasing God's heart. And so he, he prepared his heart to, to know the word of God, to seek the law of the Lord. And then not only to just seek it, but to do it. And then not just to seek it and to do it, but then to teach others as well. 
And so we see this incredible model that Ezra sets down for us. Learn it, do it, and pass it on and teach others. Here we see Ezra learning it, doing it, uh, and then teaching others uh, as well. And so verse 11, it says, and this is a copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave Ezra, the priest, the scribe, expert in the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. So we see here that now Ezra includes uh, in uh, in the scriptures here, an actual copy of the letter that he carried with him from Babylon now to Jerusalem with them. So his, this is his letter of recommendation. This is uh, his uh, paper, his official paper that, uh, that he has. In verse 12, Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra the priest, a scribe in the law of the God of heaven, perfect peace, and so forth. So Artaxerxes, notice this, and look at, look at the way he describes himself. He's the king of kings. Now, uh, he was, in fact, uh, a king of kings because uh, being the king over all, he had all of these other provinces and nations and everything else that all made up the empire now. So he was the king, but he was over other kings. And so he was a king of kings. But we see that there is one that is even higher than the king over the kings, and that is the king over all all kings uh, here and in revelation chapter 19 verse 15 we have a description uh, of jesus and and it says now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron and he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty god and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Uh, and so here we see that, uh, that Jesus Christ is the ultimate authority over every authority on the face of the earth. Uh, to Ezra, the priest. And so here we see that uh, that this decree from the king first gives them permission to leave Babylon and to go back to Judah. And the letter now that the king sent to Ezra gave him special privileges by authority of the king. And so he says in verse 13, I issue a decree that all those of the people of Israel and the priests and Levites in my realm who volunteer to go up to Jerusalem may go with you. And so here we see, I issue a decree. Now you remember that according to the laws of the Medes and the Persians, that once signed, it might not be revoked. And so you remember that that was one of the great challenges in Esther and, uh, and all that took place. Is once the king had signed a decree, it could not be undone even by the king himself. And so here we have, have this issue we have this command that uh, that goes <coughs> that goes <laughs> forth now the decree didn't oblige anybody to go it gave them permission to be able to go in verse 14 and whereas you are being sent by the king and his seven counselors to inquire concerning judah and jerusalem with regard to the law of your god which is in your hand and whereas you are to carry the silver and gold which the king and his counselors have freely offered to the God of Israel whose dwelling is in Jerusalem. So Ezra not only gets permission to go back, but he also now is given a free will offering by not only the king himself, but also his seven leading counselors. Now, those seven counselors are probably the seven princes of uh, Persia in Media. And so uh, here we see that that he is to go back now and to check on the people and make sure that they had not fallen back into idolatry. And the king and his nobles had given this contribution to him, and now he's going to carry that contribution back with him. So not only does he have the edict that's issued and signed by the king, but he also now uh, has this uh, this 
money that has been given, this free will offering by the king and by the leading princes. He says in verse 16, And whereas all the silver and gold that you may find in all the province of Babylon, along with the free will offering of the people and the priests, are to be freely offered for the house of their God in Jerusalem. Now, therefore, be careful to buy with this money bulls, rams, and lambs with their grain offerings and their drink offerings and offer them on the altar of the house of your God in Jerusalem. And so he says, and along the way, anybody else who has a free will offering to give to you, you can also collect that as well and bring that back into Jerusalem uh, as well. So Verse 18, and whatever seems good to you and your brethren to do with the rest of the silver and the gold, do it according to the will of your God. So they're to offer up the sacrifices uh, and they're to use the money to buy the, the sacrifices with. And then with whatever money you have left over, then just use it however God directs you there. And so... It says, verse 19, on also the articles that are given to you for the service of the house of your God, deliver in full before the God of Jerusalem. And whatever may more may be needed for the house of your God, which you may have occasion to provide, pay for it from the king's treasury. So he gives him this generous donation. He sends him back and then he tells him to go ahead and make sure that you offer up these sacrifices and then go ahead and use the extra money however you need it. And if that isn't enough, then go ahead and just charge my treasury and we will go ahead and take care of that. And so notice here he says, you know, and whatever seems good to you and your brethren, you know what he's saying? I don't even want you to keep receipts. Don't bring me any receipts here. Just whatever seems good and right. Why? Because he trusts the character of Ezra. The king is giving him a blank check here because he knows the character of Ezra, that Ezra isn't going to take it and use it for himself or, or rip off the, uh, the empire, but that he is going to do what is right. And so here it speaks the volumes of Ezra character that is lived out in front of the king that now the king would put this kind of trust uh, in him. And so the incredible, uh, incredible character that made him so trustworthy before the king. And that led me to a question. How are we doing in our trustworthiness? Are we trustworthy? Are we men and women of integrity? Is our yes, yes, and our no, no? Are people impressed uh, with the way that uh, we are in our honesty in our integrity in our unwavering commitment and to uh, our values and to the values that that god has set forth may that be a reputation of us may may people be impressed with our trustworthiness the bible says that he who's faithful in the little things what happens that more will be given to them and so faithful in the little things faithful in the little things how important it is to be diligent in the little things and so the little things are important why because they reflect listen the character of your heart the character of a person's heart is found in the little things the big things are nothing more than a combination of the little things added together and so faithful in the little things Verse 21, and I, even I, Artaxerxes, the king, issue a decree to all the treasurers who are in the region beyond the river. That's the uh, Euphrates River. So everybody that's over there. So he's got the different treasuries that are there. And so this letter here, he's telling him that, listen, in verse 21, that whatever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of God of heaven, may require of you, let it be done how? diligently quickly in other words when he comes and asks uh, for uh, money you're to give it to him diligently quickly 
cut through all the bureaucratic red tape. Not, you know, we have a committee meeting that's scheduled, we'll be reviewing the finances on that. If you can submit that in a proposal and paper and let us know exactly what the budgetary requirements are going to be, we'll gladly bring it before the committee and we'll have an answer for you in a decade. <laughs> You know, I mean, it's like, no, okay, <laughs> give it to him what he needs, when he needs it, do not delay this building project, this is for the temple of God, and so we see uh, how the king is so behind uh, Ezra. Uh, and so uh, it says whatever he needs, let it be done diligently. Now, he does set an upper end limit uh, of the, the, the top end of what uh, is allowed in the budget. He says, verse 22, up to 100 talents of silver, 100 cores of wheat, 100 baths of wine, 100 baths of oil and salt without prescribed uh, uh, limit. And so this is a reduction ridiculous amount of money it's a ridiculous budget but he knows that Ezra isn't going to use more than he needs he's not going to use more than he needs he is going to to go back and assess the situation and get the job handled and so uh, the king gives him more than he needs and tells him to use just what he needs and so uh, verse 23 whatever is commanded by the God of heaven let it be diligently be done for the house of the God of heaven. For why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? And so whatever is commanded to now have that temple built and properly, let it be done well. For why should there be wrath? And so we see that this particular king wanted to stay in good graces with God. He doesn't want to incur the wrath of God upon himself. And, uh, and so uh, here we see that uh, the motivation behind this verse 24. And also we inform you that it shall not be lawful to impose tax, tribute, or custom on any of the priests, Levites, singers, gatekeepers, nethanim, or servants of this house of God. So can you imagine a king not imposing taxes? <laughs> Saying, in fact, these, all of them, everybody that's involved in the house of the worship of God, you're not to tax them. So we no income tax upon them whatsoever. And you, verse 25, Ezra, according to your God-given wisdom, Set magistrates and judges who may judge all the people who are in the region beyond the river and all such as know the laws of your God and teach those who do not know them. So here we see that now in this edict that is being given by the king, he is telling him that he is to go now and set up these judges. He is to... He is giving to Ezra the civil jurisdiction over the land. I mean, not just sending him back with, uh, with provision, uh, blank check, but now also says, you are a man of God, and I want you to appoint good judges, honest judges. I want you to, to set up now magistrates and governors who are going to be good governors. Governors now that are going to have the kind of integrity that, uh, that you have. And, and he wants him now to take and to, uh, to oversee the, the running now of this entire region. He says that, that you would set magistrates and judges who may judge all the people who are on the region beyond the river. And all such as know the laws of your God and teach those who do not know them. And so here we see this proclamation from this pagan king to go and to teach God's word everywhere where they don't know God's word. He's so impressed with who Ezra is. He says, man, go and whatever has been put into you, go put that into other people, uh, can you? And that's the word of God that was in Ezra. And he tells them to go and to teach now uh, those who do not know the laws of your God. Verse 26, whoever will not observe the law of your God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed speedily on him, whether it be death or banishment or confiscation of goods or imprisonment. And so 
here we see that now even the corporal punishment and capital punishment uh, is being handed over to uh, Ezra as well. And, uh, and so this is unusual uh, here. And so Ezra is going to be the last word on everything. That's, here's the edict. Uh, and so now it puts it uh, into paper uh, and signs it now and sends uh, Ezra with this. And so Ezra now has this uh, incredible authority. In verse 27, Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers, who has put such a thing as this in the king's heart. So now what we have is we have Ezra extolling God's goodness and God's grace and God's mercy. And we see that, uh, that he recognizes that the favor that he has from this king, it's not because Ezra is such a wonderful person. It's because God has given him favor before this king and that God has moved in the heart of the king. And now we see rather than Ezra thinking how wonderful he is, he just recognizes this is all God's doing. God is in this equation here and he gives that in praise unto him. Proverbs 21.1 says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord and like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord and the Lord just turns the king's heart however he is that it wills. The Bible tells us that God raises up and he takes him down, that he exalts and that he humbles. And, and we look upon the world around us and, and we say, wow, man, it just can feel at times like it is out of control. And yet we see that God knows exactly how to turn king's hearts how to raise them up and how to and take them back down. He knows how to take wicked kings and use them as an instrument of judgment to, uh, to bring consequences where he would uh, have it to be and to be used in his divine plan. And so God's plan is unfolding exactly as God said it would. Christ is going to return right on schedule. He is going to set up his kingdom exactly as he said that he is. We are going to rule and reign in righteousness uh, with him. And we will spend all eternity with him. These are absolute facts. These are absolute truths that you can bank on, that you can build your life upon. And the question is this that I have for you tonight. Are you trying to build your own life? Are you trying to build your own plans? Are you trying to figure out where God would, you know, what you can do with your life? Or are you seeking God's plan for your life? Are you just uh, pouring out uh, your prayers to God and saying, God, direct me, direct me. You have a plan and a purpose. I don't care whether we're nine or 99. God has a plan for you. He's got a plan every single day for you. It's that day by day. It's those little things again. It's the increment of the day. Living out God's will in your life today. God, what would you have me to do? And the more that you keep seeking his face on a daily basis, God will then start to direct you on a daily basis. And then he will direct you into the thing step by step. He'll, he'll move your heart. He'll change you. He'll adjust you. You know, so oftentimes we want like, you know, this big dramatic, God, what's your will for my life? You know, what's the, what's the big thing that I want you to do today? And he's like, get out of bed. <laughs> you know, that's... <laughs> rise up and let's start by praising you know let's start by praying i know god i know all that but what's the big thing that you want me to do you know what's you know here's my life god direct me you know what do you want me to do and we're and we're wanting the the, the big things you know uh, in life and, and he says just start seeking my face come on let's just 
start walking together and I'll just effortlessly move you piece by piece. And then what he'll start to do is he'll start to put a burden into your heart. You just you'll start to you'll start to want to do something. You'll start to 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 just kind of get hungry for something, you know. And then all of a sudden, after he creates this hunger in you, there's going to be like this opportunity. <laughs> And the very thing that I was just starting to get hungry for. And, you know, it's like, man, it's like I'm starting to get hungry. And then you go to Costco. <laughs> and then there's all those little sampler things, you know, that are right there. It's like, oh, this is really good. You know, it's like, well, those are for everybody. I know, but they're good, you know. It's like he starts to give you a hunger for something. And then all of a sudden, lo and behold, Here's this little opportunity that just popped up in the very area. Isn't this crazy? You know, in the very area. You know, and the Bible says that he gives you the desires, what? The desires of your heart. But you see, here's what you have to understand. The desires of your heart have to be the desires that he placed in your heart that he then makes you hungry for, and then he gives you the opportunity so he fulfills the desires of your heart. And it's like, woohoo! <laughs> Versus the desires of the flesh. <laughs> oh God, I want a big mansion. I want a house. I want, you said you give me the desires of my heart. And it's like, no, when you humble yourself and you seek him, he gives you the desires of your heart. And see, when you're humbling yourself and you're drawing near to him, what you want is his presence over everything else. You want him. And now the things of this world start to fall away. And he just leads you and guides you just step by step. So are you trying to chase after your dreams? Are you trying to chase after your dreams? Or listen. Are you chasing after the Lord and he'll make your dreams come true? And he'll make your dreams come true. Because he'll create in you the dream that he's going to fulfill, which is his purpose. And so here we see this just this incredible way in which, you know, what is Ezra's burden? His burden is for the people that they would know the word of God. And so what does God do? Raises him up to go bring the word of God back to the nation again and start to teach the word of God and to now raise up all of the leaders that are going to teach the word of God as well. So he says, Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers who has put such a thing as this in the king's heart to beautify the house of the Lord which is in Jerusalem. So they've got it built but now to make it spectacular, to make it reflect the glory of God. You remember how amazing Solomon's temple was, but that was destroyed when the Babylonians came in and took them into captivity. So they've got a functioning temple now. They've finished it. It's a functioning temple. But now let's go make it amazing. Let's go make it beautiful. And so that he put into the king's heart, he says, which is in Jerusalem, and has extended, verse 28, mercy to me before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty princes. He's extended mercy to me. Our God is a merciful God. Amen? Is he not a merciful God? Have you not enjoyed the mercies of God uh, in your life? And so here we see that Ezra is just, just the blessedness of those mercies in his life. And so verse 28 concludes, And so I was encouraged, as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me, and I gathered leading men of Israel to go up with me. And so 
Here we see that he was encouraged. I want you to know that we all need encouragement. Everybody needs encouragement. And I want to encourage everybody to encourage everybody. That's my encouragement to <laughs> me here. Everybody needs uh, encouragement to keep on going, keep on chasing after the Lord. And, and, and the enemy is doing everything that he can to discourage you and to keep you from chasing after the Lord. And that's one of the reasons I believe that God brings us together in fellowship and community so that we can encourage one another and minister to one another and build each other up and, and raise each other up in the faith. And, and that's why I think that the Word of God tells us don't forsake the assembling together of the brethren. Don't forsake the assembling together of the brethren. But come together to what? To encourage uh, one another. Be encouraged. God has a great plan for your life. Whatever barriers are in your life, I want you to know that God is greater than the barriers that are there. Whatever trials that are going on in your life, listen, this too shall pass. The trials shall pass. If you're in a season of nighttime and of difficulty and of hardship, know this. Know that morning will come. Know that the bright rays of the dawn are, uh, are just after the darkest uh, hours of the day. And if you're in a trial, know that God sees your trial. And God collects every single tear that you cry. He knows your sorrows. He knows your hurts. And he is there to strengthen you and to walk you through to the other side. Know that every single trial God uses in your life to change your character, to mold you. That not one hardship, that not one difficulty is ever wasted, but that he's forming and fashioning your character. That all things work together for good. That all things work together for good. And so how much easier it is to be able to endure hardship in our life knowing that God's turning it for good in my life. And I will tell you, many times in my own life, I don't understand how God is going to do that. But when we look back afterwards, can we not see how God did in fact do that? And now in the next trial that I am in, I tend to to be able to trust more in the reality that God, you're going to work this together for good. I've seen you do it over and over and over and over in my life. And that continues to build a testimony of confidence in my life that this also is going to be worked and together for good in my life. So be encouraged. Ezra was encouraged. As what? As the hand of the Lord my God was upon me. Know that the hand of the Lord your God is upon you. And be encouraged. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the way that you just encourage our souls. You love us. You have a good plan for our life. May we seek your plan for our life. May we seek your will in our life. May we be able to hold on to the steadfastness of your promises that all things work together for good. That everything that's going on in my life, God will redeem. God will restore. God will mend. God will heal. God will deliver. God will bless. We stand upon these promises, the sure word of you, God. And so thank you for those promises. And thank you for your love. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.